Well, good morning again. Nice to see you up there. I wanted to start with a, a story. The talk is about accountability, and that's such a, I don't know, such a word that makes me um, wonder if my mom is here. But <laughs> um, she instilled in me uh, a, re a, a really strong ethic of, of showing up. If, if you say yes to something, you show up. And so I'm going to start with this little story. And this is uh, one night, uh, four college students were out partying late. And they were very late, so they didn't study for the test, which was scheduled for the next day. So in the morning, they thought of a plan. They made themselves look dirty with grease and dirt. Then they went to the dean and said that they had gone out to a wedding last night and on their way back to the tire, way back, the tire of their car burst and they had to push the car all the way back home. So they were in no condition to take the test. The dean thought for a moment and said that they can have a retest after three days. Well, they thanked him and they said they will be ready by that time. So on the third day, they appeared before the dean, and the dean said that this was a very special condition test. All four were required to sit in separate classrooms for this test. They all agreed, as they had prepared very well now for the last three days. Well, the test consisted of only two questions with a total of 100 points. Number one, your name, one point. Two, which tire burst? Option A, front left, B, front right, C, back left, D, back right, 99 points. <laughs> yeah, I found, I laughed at that too. I thought, you know, that is accountability. If you try to tell little white lies, even if you got your whole team backing you up on it, <laughs> you're going to have to meet your maker. You're going to have to meet your maker. So, um, Every, every action we recognize has a consequence that's uh, thought of as karma. Um, it's done unto you as you believe, right? All of those uh, stories that we speak of are those uh, wisdoms that we speak of. Even, even good intentions, sometimes um, we mean well, but they, things don't always go the way we expect and we make a mistake, or we fail to do everything that was really necessary to do, and we might come up short, and it might be an embarrassing moment for us. But the thing to do, really, is to admit it. Admit it to yourself and to others. Be accountable, be responsible. And this is something that we teach our children. Um, Mr. Rogers was really good about that. I think he was. In my time, I spoke about that at 9 o'clock. Jiminy Cricket was my Mr. Rogers. And I don't know, is there a pink dinosaur? I don't know what is it, what's teaching this message now. I, I don't have any grandchildren, so I'm not sure what, how the message is coming through. But we all have those moments in our, in our experience um, where we weren't actually accountable for what, what we did. And some of those I, that stir inside of me, I, I was supposed to take Kathy Williams home after a, a brownie meeting and it was in the evening we were doing some kind of a activity at a convalescent home singing or something like that and my mom told Tilly her mother that yeah we'll take Kathy home well my dad's the one that picked us up so there's there we are nine o'clock Kathy's trying to get in the car and I'm shutting the door hey you know bye Kathy and you know we left her on the curb I know, I got in so much trouble. I, and I think of that to this day. And I think that still stirs in me. Like, I'm, I'm leaving the Kathy Williams somewhere on a curb. And it's a, it's a stirring inside of me that keeps me awake to what is my responsibility here? You know, and, and there are certain stories of my 93-year-old mother that she doesn't let me forget that one. And she'll just say, I was so, you know, she, the way only a mother can do to make you feel, you know, really bad. And so she um, has held that over me, but in such a way I've used that as a tool 
I don't want to forget. Ask me to do something. I don't want to forget. I want to remember. I want to remember um, what I have said that I would do to be a person of my word. And I think we've also been indoctrinated with this uh, in schools when they gave you <laughs> the when you finished your year and you got 100% attendance, remember those? Do they, do they still do that? I mean, that lays a real trip on you too because it's like you wake up, measles, I can't have measles, you know, and it's like, I gotta go to school. And you're, you're just feeling like, oh, you let yourself down, you let the team down, you're not gonna get that certificate. And to this day, I can be, get, a, get a cold and I'll just think, oh, I just can't go to work. Yes, I have to go. And then it becomes sort of, sort of a martyr thing. And I show up at work and somebody goes, oh, Bill called in sick. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously, what's wrong with him? Can't he be a martyr like I am? So I don't know. I, I think the, you know, it, we can go to the extreme. We have to be, be wise. But these are all the building blocks of being accountable. And we know, we know deep inside of us. We know the quickened moment in our mind when we have been less than that. And I shared earlier, Paramahansa Yogananda says, um, your whole being tells you when you're right on target with living authentically. But that feeling that you have is God's voice inside of you. And the moment, the moment you try to hide or try to just like skirt around it, that voice, that feeling goes silent and you're all on your own because you're, you're playing with a tool that isn't authentic. You're trying to cover something up. Your conscience was not your guide. There's no little Jiminy Cricket whistling now. It's silent and you, you know those moments. And we can become very skillful in our, as we mature to uh, meet those moments and be honest and say, you know, no more. I'm going to really own this and I'm going to tell the truth. I am going to follow that inner feeling, that inner knowing that God's got my back. I just have to speak the truth. So this is all about living your values, living your morals. And these are the laws of restraint that you create for your own being. You can pick and choose all the wonderful biblical or scholared ways of, of um, listening to greater truths out there. And you can pick and choose which ones do you want to put in, in your diary of living an authentic life that is responsible for speaking truth and telling truth. It's hard to say it's my fault. It's really hard to say it's my fault. You know, I. It was really easy to blame my sisters at the table. You know, I, I sometimes think God gave me really big ears because I told little white lies. I'm, I'm not Pinocchio this way, but I'm this way. And it, <laughs> because when my dad would come in and say, who did that? And we would point to the youngest and then we'd all get our ears flicked before because he knew, they, they parents know. And so the ear flicking thing, I just feel like, man, I really, I really got that. And I learned not to uh, point the finger, but it's not always easy. Uh, you have to admit your role. People, will, people might think poorly of you even after that. And you, you have to perhaps make amends. But the temptation to let the blame fall somewhere else, I ask yourself, look at those moments in your life. They could have felt so innocent. But if you didn't tend to them, and if you don't tend to them now, they become the building blocks for you not living your authentic self. So we're asking for you to um, tell the truth, to speak your truth, to face your music. And, um, you know, when people do that, don't you respect that? Isn't there a moment of just, I really respect that you're willing to, you know, let your hair down, to let your truth show and shine. Yeah, shining. So stand up, face the music. People believe anyone who does 
will deal honestly with them. You can be trusted then. You, we all know people that have made mistakes and we're not asking ourselves to be perfect here. That's the wonderful feeling, to let go of the perfect role model and just use those as goals to, to try to strive towards. But we cannot sidestep our accountability for who we are. And you know what? The truth always is revealed. Sometimes don't we want to just say, I wish I could just tell them about something. But you know what? It always comes always comes through. So you might as well, if it's about you, be the one to strengthen this bit of courage inside of you. Admit that you've made a mistake and be sincere and avoid that in the future. And when you do this, it helps people practice the art of forgiveness. They will see you as, as, a, as a person with pure intention and you will recognize your own self strong enough, willing enough to take the consequences of your actions. And so you gain respect instead of lose respect out there in the world. It just knowing every time you admit one of your mistakes, people admire that strength. Accountability, being uh, centered on principle, centered on the law. It, you know, the law of mind gives back what our words form. Ernest Holmes says, peace comes from the absence of fear. So we're fearless in speaking our truth from a consciousness of trust, from a deep underlying faith to the absolute goodness and mercy, the final integrity of the universe in which we live and of every cause to which we give our thought, our time and our attention. If we would have peace outwardly, we must, we must realize peace inwardly. So you come to a center, you come to a community, you come to classes to dive deep into those areas where we have masked over, where we have gotten away with some of our smallness and we're being asked to really live to be strong, to be strong when we've made a mistake, not weakened, to be responsible. And there's action assigned to this. One of the wisdom ways uh, in some of the research I was doing around this talk says the next time you make a mess of things, whether it's a big mess or a little one, try to take this approach. Determine who was affected and what harm was done. Sometimes we just don't want to go there. Oh, maybe nobody, nobody will notice. But really, ask yourself the questions that we're, we were reading to you earlier are beautiful questions that bless you. They're written by John O'Donohue, who asks us to bless the space between us. So never quit asking the questions. Determine who was affected. What harm was there? And admit your role in whatever happened. Apologize, apologize, be willing to apologize for any consequence and honestly, honestly explain your actions. Tell the other that you have learned from this and promise yourself. And if you want to promise them, I'll never do it again. Make restitution if possible but be patient with the other's ability to forgive you. Work after you have admitted and work on changing your behavior. Take it as a lesson and forgive yourself. And that's probably the most challenging is to forgive yourself. You wanna be able to pay the full price for any mistake that you made and when you can pay the full price, you prosper spiritually. You build trust, and that's what we need with one another, trust. We need each other telling the truth. As we share the stories of our lives in, in classes, Mary's class just started with writing down your soul, and you have this opportunity to bypass, you know, the, the usual story that you tell, dive in deep, and find the kernel of truth that allows you to be very introspective, to be very deep and honest, to get to know yourself, and to listen deeply and reverently to those that are sharing their stories. Know your fear, know their fear. Foster those deep connections. You start to be reliable. You start to, to be the person of your word, to be one that follows through with commitment. 
if you say you're going to do such and such, you show up and you're responsible. And you develop and you flourish in that spiritual backbone that you're creating for yourself and the world around you. So always, always working with the tools of being supportive, allowing the gifts of life, the gifts of spirit that flow effortlessly through you to touch everyone you meet, to allow every situation that you're involved in to be so honest and so real, and to let every situation therefore be blessed by your consciousness, by your willingness, by your practice of speaking truth. The, the um, idea of Ernest Holmes, he says, be compassionate with yourself and with others. Compassion is the gentlest of all human virtues, for it is the outpouring of the divine givingness through man. Divine givingness is also a, a, how they describe what love is, this divine givingness, and compassion is right along there with it. Be observant with what you're doing and how you're doing, mindful of the cognitive mind, that mind that we develop with our personality that gets us out of trouble. Because I know, you know, when you're little, you're just like, ooh, what am I going to say about this one? And you can start making up your story, especially when you hear, you wait till your dad gets home, you know, and you're like, oh, God, I got to think of a really good story. And, you know, and so you, you start to practice those tools out of fear, but then you just kind of, you know, stand there. We, we were the, we got the whoopings, and so we would get the whooping, and then we would run to the bedroom and pull down our little pants and see who had the biggest handprint and then start giggling, which really bothered my parents. But... <laughs> But we took, we, you know, it's like we were practicing these stories. I'm going to tell them this, I'll tell them this, I'll tell them, oh, I'll do this. And then you can't, not when you see the stern father figure saying, you know, looking at you and you just don't, oh, I know, I know. And then you get, your, you get your comeuppance and then you move on. It's over. I don't, I'm not corporal punishment. I didn't spank my own kids, but because I didn't like those handprints. I didn't like those those uh, imprints of, of feeling so guilty and shamed. But we, we ask ourselves to take the consequences of, of what we might have done to look at cause and effect and be reliable. Every living soul, Ernest Holmes says, every living soul is a law unto himself, but of this most people are unconscious. We don't realize that how our actions are penetrating the experience of other people. And I enjoyed looking at different ways. How do we discern what is true? There's, there's questions that we can ask ourselves, um, looking at, are we using our creative word constructively or deconstructively? The word that becomes the law into the thing where it is sent becomes the concept behind it such a heady concept of Ernest Holmes. But how are we using our word and are we accountable for our word? And there's a, sounds true, to the um, owner of that company, Tammy Simon says, without discernment, we become flat out delusional in our efforts to seek out spiritual guidance. Sometimes we don't, we don't pause long enough to ask a question and to feel the stirring of truth within us, to know that we can then be accountable if we apply this principle in our world out at large. So she said, what if someone sees seven butterflies? And she said, assume right away he's supposed to get seven wives. And the, the group around her laughed, but she said, you know, Hitler thought he was being spiritually guided to purify his race. But discernment, discernment is the key that's called for here. Without her words, without clear tools of discernment, an attempt to seek out and follow spiritual guidance can turn psychotic. After all, schizophrenics think the television is talking to them. The only thing that separates the mystic and the sociopath is discernment. And I'm thinking, wow. Because we often say, listen to that still small voice, but it's crazy. Well, that's good because you're discerning that it is. Because you want to ask these questions. 
ask these questions of the voices inside of you the moment you're stirred. You know, as Paramahansa Yogananda said, you know when you're in right action. You know it because you're, you, you feel it. You're at ease with the world around you. There's nothing hiding. But you need to ask yourself if you're about to make it with your free will, with your free choice, make a decision to be less than that. Ask yourself, does it feel like shackles on or shackles off? Ask yourself what you're about to do. Is the cage opened or closed? Do you feel a heaviness or do you feel a lightness of freedom? Ask yourself, if you feel like you're being guided, does it feel like freedom? Whatever you're about to do, the choice you're about to make, is it freedom? Is there aliveness there? Check into your vitality. Is what I'm about to do create an aliveness? Or do I feel dead inside because I've just not owned my own truth? Does it exhaust me and do I feel a sense of dread? These are moments of discernment. Does it nourish me or deplete me? Does it feel natural, efficient, easeful, peaceful, and graceful? This is what Joan Barasinko speaks of as the soul, your, your soul's compass, moving to that true north to guide the heart space into a, an idea of I am being my most authentic self. I am going to speak truth no matter what the consequence might be. And in that, this feels natural, peaceful, graceful, and it makes sense. Spiritual guidance may often ask you to do things that might feel crazy. And you want to know, is this asking me to do something that violates my own common sense? Slow down. Ask for clarification. You know, we want to take time in our spiritual longing and our spiritual practice as we sit in stillness, in moments of calling into the breath and lingering in those moments of, of deep, pure stillness, listening to the sound of the bell, listening to the end of the prayer in such a way is it stirring me and my paying attention to the calling of myself to stand in truth. And if you're not sure, keep asking for my, more guidance. But most important, will whatever you do hurt anyone? Is it going to harm anyone? What would love do here? You know, that used to be a saying, what would Jesus do? But I ask you, your teacher, yourself, your soul, what would love do? What would Jiminy Cricket do? What would Mr. Rogers do? You know, find your teachers to say, what would the right way of being here motivate me, propel me into living a more pure life experience? And so you want to lead with love. Nothing more powerful in the universe. As you discern all these questions, this feels like, wow, all that before I even say yes or no to something. Discerning. Yeah, spend time because you're putting your word and the power of your word, you're putting that on something. So let it be a word of truth. Don't rush it. Don't rush it at all. Allow for this spiritual guidance to be that which prepares the way to make the crooked places straight. To take time to, to call God in, knowing that God's always present. But sometimes that part of our mind that isn't allowing our soul to speak, that just puts everything in order and wants us to get out of trouble, that cognitive part of our mind that just said, this crazy stuff. Stay with the crazy just a little bit to see what the truth underneath that is, to listen to the soul's longing. You want to make sure that all your actions never control or coerce anyone. You want to know that what you're doing and what your actions are showing, that you're, it's ethical and it's aligned with a core value, living your values. What are yours? What are yours? Ernest Holmes speaks of his. The teaching speaks of, of many wise masters. They speak theirs. And you might say, I feel that in me. That is mine. It aligns with that. I am spiritually guided in that knowing. 
And will my actions stir and cultivate a stillness in me? Because we know when we have told little white lies that there is a restlessness in us. Because now we have to kind of remember that white lie in case it spreads over here, you know? They're, they're miserable. They just kind of sprout. And then you've got to do uh, weed control on these things. So is it, it's huge. Emphasize this in our, in our culture now. Is this cultivating a stillness in me? What's true, what's not true about what I'm about to do, what I'm about to be? And in the end, just knowing that we never want to give away our authority, do we? Not to anyone here. You want to stand true to yourself, to take responsibility for your life. Never give it up, never forfeit it for anyone. I want us all to walk in a path of such deep respect, such devotion to yourself and to your teachers and to the community so that we all show up without, nothing, without anything to hide, just pure joy, pure honesty. And if we're in a place of suffering or, or if we're in a place of doubt or trouble, we share it because we know what will be mirrored back to us is only truth and love back. That's what this place is about. We desire truth above all else. Listen, listen, listen. Listen to your soul because it craves certainty. Be curious, be willing to not know sometimes, to stand in the question, asking for guidance. Live in that neighborhood of true self. Ask yourself if what I've been sharing has poked any old patterns inside of you. Are you willing to rest in the silence of the breath? And are you willing to look at the spark inside your soul that always, always, always leads you with love? Watch for those quickening signs of truth. They can come through the portals of dreams. They can come through just a song, a phrase, a word, a prayer, a glance, the sky. Watch for the portals of truth as we recognize that we are the divine conduits. We are filled with this divine grace. It motivates us. And as we are accountable to that, we become strong and we account for our mistakes, and we move on, and we practice the tools of forgiveness, and we tell the truth. In closing, Anadana Shante, uh, he writes this book in The Way of Liberation, and he closes it. He's saying, this is the summary of his teaching. Be still. Question every thought. Contemplate the source of reality. And keep your eyes open. You never know when something that seems entirely insignificant will split your whole world wide open into eternal delight. Wow, that's what I want. I want us to walk around just spl splitting wide open, letting the light in through the cracks of our heart until that piece of the soul that is sometimes buried so deep we feel like the light shut out but we're willing to be true to the teaching, to keep our eyes and our heart wide open. And these questions that were read to you from uh, O'Donohue, you know, you ask yourself at night, when am, am I awake? Did I pay attention to even the slightest suffering? that was imprinted upon me? Did I even give it any time? Did I forgive the person that inflicted it upon me unknowingly? Am I just moving through my days, just marking off the calendar I lived another day? Or am I looking out into this vast space of freedom and potentiality and, and calling in love and law and saying, I am a co-creator with my experience. Am I fully living? Am I alive? Am I awake? Am I listening? 
Am I forgiving myself and others? Those questions, those questions are so important for you to be accountable, to live in a truth. Keep asking questions. Keep asking questions and keep listening to the answers. There's a, an affirmation that one of the um, ministers in our movement wrote about this uh, accountability. She said, life is not accountable to us. Life isn't. We are accountable to life, ourselves and each other. And so that is. So join with me in a prayer. As you think of these questions at the end of the day, what dreams did I create last night? Where have my eyes lingered? Where have I been blind? Where was I hurt and no one noticed? What did I learn? What have I read? What new thoughts have quickened me and visited me? What difference did I notice in those so closest to me? Whom did I neglect and did I neglect myself? What did I begin today that might endure? How were my conversations this day? What did I do for the poor? What did I do for the excluded? Did I remember those that have passed away today? Have I exposed myself to be at risk to try something different? Have I allowed myself to receive love? And with whom have I been my truest self today? Who saw me? What visitations have I from the past and from the future? Has there been anxiety or worry? Those are the visitations. What are they trying to tell you? They're knocking at your door. What did you avoid today? And look at all the evidence as you gather and accumulate the answers of your heart as they drop before the altar of your heart. And you listen. You ask yourself, why was I given this day? You were given this day to be one, to be one with the divine, to be one with love, and to operate from a deep sense of the absolute. As you create that union, God's with you in every breath, in every word, in every action. And as you say, yes, to your life experience, you wake up. You are awake and ready for God's glory to move through you, to propel you into the next experience, the next opportunity. How wonderful is that? As we saturate ourselves with a prayer that moves and stirs our soul into right action, into discernment, into the power of knowing how to ask for forgiveness how to be the one that forgives. Therefore, we walk and live in peace, in absolute knowing that we are charged as the divine disciple that moves forward in our world, being the peace. I give thanks for the teaching, for the wisdom, for the way our services come together, for the ways that we each open up at the top and ask the divine to just stir me, move me, wake me up. Let me tell the truth. Thank you, God, for a place where I can be my truest self. I release this word knowing that it dwells within all of us with every breath. I say thank you, God, for keeping me awake. And so it is.